This is Otaku Station, broadcasting anime analysis to anyone who will listen. We have a basement archive full of an ever-growing collection of anime media. We dig deep into the great anime of the past to give you the context you need to fully appreciate the best this medium has to offer. Let's jam. Welcome to the broadcast. I hope you're having a good day, wherever you happen to be right now. This is Otaku Station, where today we'll be talking about the second half of the original 1995 Ghost in the Shell movie. As a reminder, last time we watched and analyzed the first half of that film. Today we'll look at the second half, and then we'll save the after-watch analysis for the following broadcast. Uh, Steve's actually still here in the tower. He's downstairs eating cookies and watching a an old horror movie from the 1980s called Rock and Roll Nightmare. Um, it's actually kind of fun. I've seen it. But uh, for now, I actually wanted to share with you all some context on the staff behind Ghost in the Shell, some of the other things they've done, and how that might cast some more helpful light on this movie. So let's head down to the research room. Let's talk about the staff of Ghost in the Shell. And we'll start with the original mangaka. As I mentioned in the last broadcast, Shiro tended to do shorter manga, one to maybe five volumes long at most. Ghost in the Shell collected into a single volume with essentially unconnected episodic stories in the first half and then the Puppet Master storyline in the last half. That's really what they focused on here for this movie. Now, if you like Ghost in the Shell and want to go back and read more of Masamune Shiro's works, be aware he tends more towards the sci-fi action comedy side of things. Um, he doesn't really do deep philosophical stuff. Those do wind up and show up here and there in his works, particularly in the Ghost in the Shell manga, um, but it's just not a, a constant feature of his works the way they are in Oshii's uh, movie and some of his other works. So just be aware tonal differences between the manga and the anime. Uh, so we want to talk about Mamoru Oshii. Um, and he worked on one of the latest action comedy, sci-fi action comedies in anime, Urusai Yatsura. And I think that's an, an important example of what's going on here. Um, in that Oshii, for example, directed the Urusai Yatsura movie Beautiful Dreamers, where the characters find themselves in this sort of pocket dimension and aren't sure like how to get out of it and what's real and so forth and so on. Uh, so he likes playing around with this stuff, but it should be pointed out, he doesn't always make dark, serious stuff. He sometimes does. Angel's Egg is all symbols. But um, he can play in a light, fun world and be light and fun. Ghost in the Shell is just him saying, nope, we're just going to go very dark and philosophical here uh, for the entire movie. So just be aware there are, again, differences in the stuff he does. Uh, after Ghost in the Shell, he went on to do a few other things, mostly live action movies, actually. Um, though he did make an animated sequel to the Ghost in the Shell movie called Ghost in the Shell 2 Innocence. Now, important thing to note there, um, that is not based on the manga at all, except having the characters and world, uh, that is very much Oshi deciding to tell his own new story in the the Ghost in the Shell universe, if you will. Well, I say his story, his and the screenwriter's story, because Oshi works a lot with Kazunori Ito, and Ito is an anime writer, writer of films and other things, and a longtime collaborator with Mamoru Oshi. Oshii does not actually write the screenplays for his movies. He conceptualizes, comes up with ideas, but he relies on, on screenwriters to write the actual screenplays. And that's what Kazunori Ito did for Ghost in the Shell and a lot of other Oshii's works. Pat Labor, uh, Avalon, a live action film he made. Um, and Ito's worked for more than just Oshii. He is the main writer behind the Dot for Hack franchise. So if you're familiar with dot hack sign or dot hack liminality or any of the other stuff that's very much Kazunori Ito's work uh, and a lot of his works 
tend to take place in an artificial world of some kind and include characters who don't know exactly what's real. So you can see how he's a good fit for Oshi on Ghost in the Shell. Uh, so those are three of the main folks working on the movie. Kenji Kawaii also did the amazing soundtrack, um, but there's not much else for me to say other than Kenji Kawaii does really notable, you know, soundtracks. And uh, yeah, so again, we'll 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 stop there and go on to actually look at the movie. Welcome back. I hope you found that useful. Quick update, Steve really did not like Rock and Roll Nightmare. Like, he kind of went off on it. But uh, now he actually wants us to spend a little time on a palate cleanser, some other horror anime. So I've got to got to think about that. What would be a, what would be a really, uh, uh, like, a, a high-quality, if you will, uh, horror anime? Well, well, we'll get to that. Meanwhile, let's get back into Ghost in the Shell. Watch out for the increased use of philosophy and introduction of philosophical elements here in the second half of the movie. So now let me uh, call in Steve and we will get John on the line. The Major's on the boat, presumably, maybe, Yeah. Um, looking up through the window and sees herself. Yeah. That your point about there, you know, could be similar models of her mm. that are just kind of extant and running around. Or could it be she's looking at who she could have been if she was still human? Oh, interesting. Yeah. So this is a little moment. She, yeah, you know, in her head, like you were saying, this is sort mm -hmm. of in the major's head right here. She's looking up and seeing, like, you know, what would my life kind of be like if I wasn't in Section 9? Yeah. If I was just at a cafe on a computer just mm -hmm. being a person doing people things. Yeah. So that's, that's what, what ran right. through my mind. Yeah, was. I like that interpretation, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Notice to her expression in this sh shot, actually to your point, John, um, this is a much less certain expression yeah. than we saw before. Um, she's thinking, she's wondering more here. Almost like a level of doubt across her face. Yeah, agreed. And notice the building under construction, right? Metaphor for construction and, you know, change. Right. Yeah. And drawing the entirety of all that scaffolding. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and to our earlier point, <clears throat> um, the signals on yield, meaning she's pausing, she's thinking, she's processing. Hmm. There's actually a pretty sad image here. You know, the implication being that is she garbage? What, what has been thrown away and not right. kept? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All elements of like everyday kind of life, a stool, a bicycle. Yeah. So what, what elements of an everyday normal life has she thrown away yeah. to be in section nine? Exactly. Also the interesting image here of like who's that? Right? That's not the major. No right. not wearing the right clothes. Is that a mannequin? Hard is that that she is envisioning herself as one of those dolls in the window? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like tears in the rain. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Um, rain also being a metaphor for being um, lost in a crowd, right? Many, mm. many, many, many droplets of water, all the same, all getting washed away, if you will. And you'll notice how we're getting less and less personal mm -hmm. as the sequence goes in. It's more long shots of just general buildings, general rain. And rather poetic. I think we've all had those experiences where, as we're out on our walk, as we're doing whatever, our mind, you know, just wanders farther and farther. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bottom right corner, a bunch of kids come in with umbrellas. And they make sure to give them yellow umbrellas. So we really see that, these kids coming in. And again, it's the, the, the idea of childhood, but also that idea of, again, biology, right? She can't have kids. Mm -hmm. What is right. she giving up? Uh, she's kind of doing this voyage through it yeah you know we're looking uh, we're looking definitely at what she's thinking about what's yeah. being thrown away cast away things she can't do anymore we can't mm. have like the children but then again take a look at what she's actually looking at and it's mm. and it's uh, poverty it's crime it's dirt true it's, it's run down and mm. things are run down and she's you know this is the thought process of okay this is what i'm giving up but is that 
to bed and mm. is what I'm doing meaning anything? Yeah. And mm. you have to see the kids mm. running across what you what she's seeing is future that she's not yeah. being a part of. True. Yeah. But arguably a future she's trying to protect. Right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Um, now this shot they hold on for quite a while. And it took me a little, little to to figure out what what this means. Why were you holding a shot of a, a a wall? This is manufactured objects that all look the same, right? <coughs> These are cyborgs basically on the wall, just same thing over and over and over and over. Right. Uh, not only did somebody have to animate that bus going through, they had to animate the reflection. And the the lights inside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sheesh. Uh, um, I also do appreciate the um, sign saying "ensuring lifelike life -like performance" on the mm -hmm. left. Right. Mannequins, <clears throat> you know, lifeless forms, mimicking humanity, but not really humanity. Um, but not unlike what we saw of the the, uh, the major's body initially. Right. 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 This is a. I think a call out for the manga readers. Oh right. Folks who read the manga know who this is. They recognize this character from the manga. Having it just right there in your face, so to speak, uh, tells the manga readers. Now we get to this part. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's call out the <clears throat> implied electrocution. Yeah. Here. Um, and how clinically they're treating this. Yeah. They're all just standing there staring down at, down at it like it's an operating table on a dead body. I want to call out the body language here. Um, it's an episode of NCIS. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's just folks kind of lounging around, checking this out, very casual. Um, for this point in a movie, you know, to have this kind of a moment is kind of remarkable. That, that, that everyone's kind of back to basics, back to normal. What is up with the beating of the heart? Great question. Yeah. Because if she has no biological cells in her, we're not hearing the end, the cyborg or whatever that yeah. thing is. We're not hearing its heart. So what are we hearing? True. Notice um, the how quickly uh, Aramaki has recognized what the real problem here is. You know, the fact that somebody hacked in and made, got this body made and took it is much less important than the fact that there is a ghost operating in a, a blank body. Right. You know, we've got to get to the bottom of that first. That's, that's, if that's possible, that's a much huger deal. That, that's a big problem. That's yeah. an issue. Why are there two cars? Two identical cars. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. And presumably old models. So not with all the highest tech stuff in it necessarily. Hmm. Note here how Togusa has this whole conversation back and forth. As they're having the conversation, he pulls his gun. Like he, he knows the implications of what this is. He doesn't have to wait for the Major to tell him. He's ready to go yeah. immediately. Yeah. A few things to note here. A, presumably they are giving over the body to Section 6. Um, two, they've already disassembled half of it. Yeah. They've had legs before. So notice how this scene is doing two things at once. It's giving us backstory, which, let's be honest, is a little bit blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, but it's also showing the major z zoning in on this body and how focused she is on the threat of this, uh, this individual. When he looks up the living, breathing entity from the Sea of Information, the halo mm -hmm. that is around him, mm -hmm. or her, her, yes, yeah. given the circumstances, um, feels very uh, pan-Scottish kind of create, yeah. creation kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. Great call out. You're absolutely right. To that point, I do want to call out something just to take a side path into computer science. Um, this is not how brains work. <laughs> um, <clears throat> brains are, uh, have highly specialized parts of them that handle each individual part of, of things. When you throw a bunch of information into something, it does not naturally organize into the different 
pieces of the brain to make it work. So the idea that, a, that information can spontaneously create something that we would recognize as a brain, not really feasible, right? It's just not the way biology works. <coughs> it's like saying, I'm, you know, because we're all molecules, I'm going to throw a bunch of molecules at a screen until a human shows up. You know, it's just not <laughs> how that works. Um, but as a sci-fi premise, fascinating. Yes. Right. Re really, really um, cool to think about, um, especially in a science fiction future in which literal brains are being transferred on the internet. Yeah. Right. So that yeah. is another factor. Well, and I think obviously this, the C reference is primordial, mm. primordial C, not yeah. to bring Genshin into things. Um, <laughs> but just sort of that idea of like, oh, yes, yeah, so, you know, the first very simple forms that, mm -hmm. that appeared in the primordial C were a, a sort of coalescence of all these amino acids and other things and suddenly life. And it's like, ah, kind of seems to be the sort of thing. It's like, oh, no, no, all this data is this primordial soup. And then somehow some bits of it link together and bang life yeah or consciousness right um, um experts say if that happened it would take like a million years you know right. on the computer we, and then we, we would be seeing digital coelacanths and digital you know right. ev yeah. evolved yeah. life forms um, um and I, I bring that up just because a lot of people watch ghost in the shell and go that's gonna happen tomorrow right and it's like <laughs> no. no you know this is a this is a sci-fi it, premise it, it's not gonna happen tomorrow Need. Can you, you need prove a it has the size of deep think in order to be able to do that? Exactly. Yeah. Notice first futuristic car we've seen. You know, it's a DeLorean, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everything else has been a very recognizable kind of modern car. Notice his reaction here. He's surprised. Yeah. They're that far ahead of him on this whole situation. <laughs> he's like, yeah. he's normally the guy who's just like. Yeah, I already figured this out a long time ago. <laughs> we're, 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 this is after the fact for me. Do you think she paused because she knows she she could be on the receiving end of that same kind of yeah. order from somebody else? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, also, because she's been studying this for so long, you know she doesn't want to. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So there's a little bit of rebellion in that pause to say, mm, mm. Um, I do want to call out a fun thing here. Um, notice that all three of these um, uh, secretaries, I don't know, um, are the same model, all the same girl. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. There's, a, there's two reasons for that. One is, this is the secretary from Dominion Tank Police. Yeah. Um, <laughs> nice. So the, the secretary girl from that. Um, in the universe, though, the reason is um, Aramaki really likes this model of girls with, with pigtails. Um, so we just ordered that all of the girls, all of the Android models running in his specific like um, lab would all be that model. Um, because it, it's, it's his little, you know, I want one thing for myself, this is my thing, you know. <laughs> Cute girls with pigtails. Exactly. Okay. Ponytails, I suppose. Okay. Say. It's the major. He's in yeah. love with the major. Right, yeah. that's the... Or the, she's in love, or whatever it is. Right, the, the joke, right, that, you know, um, I don't think he knows anything about the Major, but that's kind of where the... Right. The, that's, that's funny. And I appreciate the difficulty of trying to get the look across the car to see yeah. the character in the foreground, the yeah. character in the background, the reflection of the character in the background, and the reflection mm -hmm. of the character that was in the foreground across yep. the car. Like, yeah. damn. <laughs> Not easy. Notice the streaks on the windshield. Ooh, yeah. Which they do move as it goes along. They animate those streaks. Wow. Oh yeah, see one coming up from that side. Yeah. Yep. Gosh. Dang. <clears throat> Blade Runner, anyone? Blade Runner, anyone? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tyrell Absolutely. Corporation. Yep. A thousand percent. Um, also, it's almost certainly CGI. Yeah. The the building in the background, just because of how much it's moving. Damn. Yeah. I think when when you see that in a movie, you know something's gonna happen. Yeah. No, it's okay. This piece of sheet metal protect me. <laughs> Can't talk if you're dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Fish. 
symbolism. And again, we see how heavy her body is. Yep. The fish are there because she's a Pisces. Ah, I see. <laughs> also note the use, of, the use of music here, right? It's not pumping action music. Very right. low key, very quiet. Serial. Yeah. So in this shot, um, the major is hiding behind this wall that we see is partly chewed up. It shoots it and chews up more of the, the wall. But that's a background. After it's chewed it all up, we see a different background. How do they do that? Right? Do you think about that? Like this is a, a cell on a background. Yeah. Suddenly the background right. is, part of the background is moved. But they did. Partway through, through all of those sparks going in the, in the, behind them, they swap backgrounds. <laughs> so they, they, they probably photocopied and painted a new background and just, you know, because it doesn't, the left side of that is going to look exactly the same. So at some point you just swap backgrounds and now you have the new background. And they're showing here, you know, how much damage it's done and how it's just lightly tarnished. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's doing fine. Love that scene. Yeah. Um, very cool shot. The symbolism here is that it is it is tearing up the uh, chart of evolution. Right. The tree of life. Yeah, literally Transition. destroying the history of what life means. Yeah, I think those are the same glasses the other guy had that we saw before. So providing him some kind of visual ability. And so one of the points here being that she is trying something superhuman, which she can do because she is. Right. Yeah. At a cost, obviously. At a cost. Interesting choice of visuals here. We have the destroyed tree of life on top of the uh, dead tank, right? Um, with the major between them, right? They're setting up there on the stairs, presumably. Um, so kind of the mediation between the technology and the human is really what we're, what we're setting up here. So why have such a long shot of that, uh, long zoom in? Because they're representing the major waking back up. Right. And that, um, what would you call it? Um, discombobulation as yeah. you're kind of coming back awake. There it is. That <coughs> is Ghost in the Shop. Welcome back. I hope you found that useful. Uh, good news. I figured out the horror anime to watch with Steve. Uh, we ended up watching Blood the Last Vampire, which if you haven't seen it, it's a about an hour long. It's actually set during Halloween at a Japanese military base, and it's got vampires. So perfect anime horror experience and pairs nicely with the horror of the world of Ghost in the Shell much of the time. Uh, anyway, that'll do it for today. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next time with our summation of the themes of Ghost in the Shell. And until then, watch more anime.